Ladies and gentlemen, would you please take seats? So it's so quiet here after lunch. Therefore, we will try to bring some life into this room for the next two hours and a half. Uh, as it has been announced, we will have a workshop here on reducing CO2 emissions in goods transport. I'm the moderator. My name is Werner Rotengatter. I'm with the Karlsruhe University in Germany, and my field is transport economics, and in the last years also logistics, in particular micro-logistics. Well, our topic is a little bit more complicated, in my view, than the topic which has been discussed in the morning in the passengers' part, because in the passengers' part, it's better possible to cluster the different demand categories and to apply econometric methods to forecast behavior. Um, in the freight sector, the behavior is very heterogeneous. Every firm is an individual in optimizing their logistics according to their individual needs, so it's much more difficult to find regularities compared with the passenger side, and therefore it's also very difficult to give general advices. But, say, our challenge in the next two and a half hours is to examine the potential for reducing CO2 emissions from freight transport. Secondly, to explore the instruments which might be appropriate to guide behavior to the desired direction. And third, to work out first figures the first list may be of cost-effective actions which might be implemented already in the short run because the challenge is already to start with actions in the short run, not to wait until 2050 with measures against climate change. As you can read in the Stern report, climate change is the biggest problem of economics since the Industrial Revolution, okay, and therefore we cannot wait 40 years or so with trying to solve this most challenging problems which we have to face. Well, the problem with freight in particular is that we have strictly rising, a rising tendency of demand. And demand is rising with higher growth rates than GDP. And this also shows us that decoupling freight transport from GDP will be extremely difficult. And freight transport it's not so much related to GDP rather than to trade and global exchange. So it's related to the globalization and offshoring activities. And global trade is increasing at the double rate comparing with world GDP. Okay? So the driver is not GDP rather than trade, and trade is developing much more dynamically. So that makes it difficult to achieve the general goal which the European Union has set with minus 20 or minus 30 percent CO2 production uh, until the year 2020. But nevertheless, there is a potential, and it is the challenge for this uh, round uh, to identify such potentials and to identify the instruments which are appropriate to come close to this goal. Well, it is a difficult goal, and therefore it's necessary to have highly distinguished experts to discuss this problem. I'm very, very happy that we have four of the best experts uh, to uh, introduce into the topic. So we have four speakers, and we have three discussants afterwards. And my suggestion is that we have two presentations in a sequence, and after that, a discussion including the floor. And after these four presentations, including discussions, we would have a break after about 90 minutes or so, after one hour and a half. And in the second round, after the break, we would then discuss the policy implementations. Okay, we will then have a brief introduction uh, by Jan Anne Anema on the political scope of uh, instruments on the most 
effective instruments uh, according uh, to the scientific analysis which uh, can be presented now. And after that, an open discussion, including all speakers, all discussions, and the floor on the ways to go and the messages to give to the political side. As you may know, tomorrow we will have a, a presentation in the uh, ministerial part of the uh, program and uh, within the ministerial industry panels, uh, we have the possibility to present to the political side the basic outcomes of our discussion of today. So we should use this opportunity and come out with very clear advices to the political side. So this concludes my introduction, and now I would like to invite Alan McKinnon to take the floor and introduce us uh, to, say, the options of reducing freight transport emissions. I suggest that every speaker and every discussion introduces him or herself briefly. Please, the floor is yours. Is that better? Yes, okay. Um, Alan McKinnon, um, Professor of Logistics from Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, uh, where we specialise in freight transport uh, issues. Um, I think I've got ten minutes. Uh, I've got to set a good example too to my fellow speakers by adhering to that time scale. So there isn't too much time for preamble. Um, what I'd like to do is to set the scene by giving us some feel for the magnitude of the problem that faces us and then look at some of the options for trying to uh, decarbonise uh, freight operations. Uh, just picking up on the point that Werner made on the forecast growth of freight tonne kilometres, um, according to this projection, there will be a threefold increase in freight tonne kilometres by 2050 over a period when we're going to be trying to cut CO2 emissions by variously 50 to 80 percent. Um, other problem, too, is that it seems that the carbon intensity of freight transport is increasing, um, partly because rail and water are losing market share and, and road and air are increasing their share of the freight market and also partly because the utilisation of freight vehicles appears to be declining partly as a result of just-in-time pressures. Um, so that is the challenge basically that faces us. How do we decarbonise freight and try to resist some of these trends? Um, how do we do that? Well, there are a whole range of measures that we could deploy. Um, the use of uh, stabilisation wedges have been applied to whole economies to see how one could um, deviate from the business as usual trend. Uh, to my knowledge, nobody has yet applied that analysis to freight transport and logistics, um, but if one were to, one we can maybe specify things like improving fuel efficiency, improving load factors, um, to get that divergence from the business as usual case and hopefully try to curb the growth in CO2 emissions. Um, we have uh, developed a, a framework uh, in the research that we've done. Um, to try to review systematically the options available for decarbonising freight transport. Um, one of my colleagues calls this the nine lever model uh, because there are nine key parameters that you would probably want to, to change and they're the ones represented in yellow boxes on that diagram. Um, so at the top end there are what I would call the more uh, strategic uh, uh, factors like modal split, um, factors influencing the structure of supply chains number of links in those supply chains, the average length of those supply links, um, determined by the way that companies plan and manage their production and, and distribution operations. And then as you move down that diagram, you get into the area of operational decisions um, that can be influenced in the shorter term, relating to vehicle load factors, empty running, uh, also fuel efficiency of the vehicles. And then right at the bottom, we're looking at the movement of the vehicles on the road, the times of day when the vehicles travel, their exposure to traffic congestion, um, and also the carbon intensity of the fuel that's used, possibility of switching to uh, alternative fuels which have a lower carbon intensity. Um, so this gives some idea then of, of the number of levers that are available to policymakers uh, to try to cut the carbon footprint of freight operations. Um, I was engaged by a UK government commission to try to construct some scenarios for the reduction in CO2 emissions from the freight transport sector. Uh, this is my aspirational scenario, so I have to cheer everyone up. Um, one thing I did was uh, assume a fairly modest growth in underlying tonne kilometres up to 2020 of about 7%. Um, Werner said earlier it's going to be very hard to decouple 
freight transport from GDP. Um, in effect, it's actually been achieved in the UK, but I'll come back to that subject in just a moment. Um, I then anticipated a shift in freights away from road towards rail and water, um, increased vehicle utilisation in trucks and vans and rail and water, um, increased fuel efficiency, um, reduction in carbon intensity, mainly from a switch to biofuels. I did this two years ago before biofuels fell out of favour. Um, and if you factor all that together, it would suggest you maybe could get a reduction of a quarter in CO2 emissions over maybe a 15-year uh, time period. Um, how would you achieve that? Well, there are a range of policy initiatives that could be applied. Um, the ones I've represented in blue on the right-hand side are the economic ones relating to things like road pricing or um, grants to encourage freight modal shift um, or lower duty for alternative fuels. Um, and I've tried to indicate in that diagram how these various policy measures could impact on the key parameters that I identified in the previous diagram. Some of those measures are quite targeted on particular parameters. Other ones would have much broader impact. Um, one of the most widely discussed um, measures, of course, the, the stick, um, would be to increase fuel duty um, in an effort to encourage more efficient use of energy in the freight sector. This was tried in the UK um, in the 1990s when we had a fairly radical fuel duty escalator policy, increasing fuel duty in real terms by 5% and then 6 terms, 6% 6 per annum. Um, and you can see during that period, um, the fuel efficiency of trucks actually went up quite significantly. Um, However, it couldn't be continued indefinitely. Um, there was an industrial backlash in uh, the year 2000. Um, and it's very hard for any country unilaterally to uh, adopt such a radical fuel duty policy. It's also worth pointing out, too, that over the six years of that policy, it uh, increased fuel prices by 35%. Um, and in fact, over the eight, past eight months, we've seen, an eight, uh, we've seen a 30% increase in fuel prices over the past eight months, simply as a result of market forces. So I would argue, do we need high fuel duties when the, the market seems to be doing the job for us? That was the stick. On the carrot side, um, in Britain we have what's called the Freight Best Practice Programme, a government programme using reports like these ones, um, management workshops, management tools, benchmarking exercises, to advise companies, to encourage them to improve the energy efficiency of their freight transport operations. Um, some work has been done recently to assess the cost effectiveness of this program, and the results are very positive. Um, suggests over a, a three year period that about a quarter of uh, road fleets in the UK, the managers of those fleets, um, were aware of the program, and about 9% of managers had actually implemented uh, some of the aspects of that program. And the companies that had actually made use of this material. Um, had a much higher propensity to implement these energy saving measures than those that didn't. Um, they themselves yielded cost savings from doing this and from the government standpoint this represented a very cost effective carbon abatement measure. Um, it's estimated that about a quarter of a million tonnes of CO2 were saved as a result of the implementation of these measures and that works out at a cost per tonne of carbon saved of about eight pounds. It gets onto the more general question about the cost effectiveness of a whole range of sustainable logistics measures. Um, the government's given me some data for the UK but asked me not to quote them, so that's why I've simply identified them as measures one to seven. But you can see how these measures vary in the cost um, to government per tonne of carbon saved. But how many of these measures are financially justified? Well, of course, that depends on the monetary value that you attach to, uh, to carbon. And I've, I've put on that slide um, some of the current estimates. You know, so at one end, you can look at what you would have to pay to offset your carbon emissions, currently around £15 a tonne. At the other end, if you use the stern estimate for the social cost of carbon, inflated to the 2006, uh, you get a much higher value. Uh, and in between, you've got, well, for example, the current euro emissions trading value of a tonne of carbon or the UK government shadow price. Uh, this is confusing to companies, because if a company is trying to decide um, what investment it should make in carbon abatement measures, um, it wants to be clear as to which number to plug into the calculations for the value of a tonne of carbon. And as yet, as I say, there's still some confusion on that issue. I should also say that many of these sustainable logistics measures will yield benefits other than carbon savings. Other environmental costs will be reduced and there will be economic cost savings as well. 
Um, a lot of people recently have been constructing abatement cost curves similar to this. Stern did it in his report. Um, McKinsey consultants have done it. Um, no one, to my knowledge, has done it as yet for freight and logistics. This is the closest I've been able to come. It's an analysis done in Germany by McKinsey of the transport sector, and it looks at a whole range of carbon abatement measures. The ones on the left-hand side are the ones that save you money, as well as cutting carbon. The ones on the right-hand side actually incur some financial cost. Um, and the width of the columns represent the potential CO2 savings. Um, regrettably, there are only four of those transport measures relate specifically to freight. So on the left-hand side, aerodynamic profiling of, of heavy trucks is deemed to be very cost-effective, um, whereas on the other hand, hybridization of light vans is considered uh, not to represent a very cost-effective way of uh, cutting carbon. Um, I'd like to end my presentation by just highlighting a few of the general points that I've made in, in my paper, and you can find my paper in the CD in your pack. Um, first point is to say that reducing freight movement does not necessarily reduce CO2 emissions. Um, and I think that's well illustrated um, in the case of Britain's sourcing of a lot of its agricultural produce from New Zealand. Um, if you conduct a full life cycle analysis of that food sourcing decision, um, what you find is that in New Zealand they produce dairy produce, lamb, apples, much more energy efficiently than we do in the UK. And even if you allow for a deep sea container movement of 18,000 kilometers, um, it is actually still much better for the planet in terms of CO2 emissions for us to continue to source our food over those long distances. So um, we shouldn't just focus on transport, we should be doing a, a broader life cycle analysis um, to determine um, the extent to which we sh should source things locally. Also to make the general point that companies these days manage and plan their transport within the context of logistics. Um, and they're forever making cost trade-offs between transport, warehousing, inventory, and so forth. Um, now, one of the main logistics trends over the past 30, 40 years has been the centralization of inventory. That's been one of the main drivers of freight traffic growth. And I think there's no denying that in transport terms, there's a carbon penalty associated with that. There's a case study here of a Swedish company that, like so many companies, moved from a nationally based system of distribution in Europe to a pan-European system, and as you can see there, carbon footprint grows significantly. But if you take account of the carbon savings through inventory centralization and through operating bigger warehouses, that in logistics terms, it can actually be desirable to centralize. So although there may be more transport generated, the savings you can make in situ in your factories and your warehouse can offset those additional uh, CO2 emissions from transport. Another general point I make is what I call the global redistribution of freight-related CO2 emissions. It um, gets back to the point I mentioned a few moments ago that Britain has managed to, it appears, to decouple tonne-kilometre growth from GDP growth. But that's partly because we've deindustrialized, that we've offshored much of our manufacturing to other parts of the world. Um, and when the assembly plants go off to China or to Eastern Europe, with them go the upper links in the supply chain so that the freight transport intensity of the economy reduces. Um, it makes the country look quite good because it cuts its carbon footprint, but in global terms, of course, it's, it's anything but. Um, the Kyoto methodology, of course, doesn't reflect that at the moment. On the graph at the bottom there, the, the yellow area is Britain's national carbon footprint judged in Kyoto terms, and it seems to be declining. If, however, you factor into the calculation all the embedded carbon and the imports and, and all the fuel and the international transport services, um, you increase that footprint by about 50%. Um, so, again, we shouldn't be too nationalistic in our policies. We should be taking a broader global view of all of this. Freight modal splits. Again, many policymakers think the main way of decarbonizing freight transport is to shift everything to rail and water. Well, it's certainly a very um, positive policy. But, again, we should be very careful in, in how we analyze the consequences of that. Um, I'm sure you've seen many graphs like this one, which compare the carbon intensity of different transport modes. Uh, those figures relate to the UK. But in interpreting that data, you've got to be very careful what assumptions have been made about the vehicle load factors. You've got to ask, do the figures relate to line haul movements or are they full door-to-door -door movements for intermodal services? In the case of electric rail, I mean, what are the primary energy sources for the, for the rail operations? Are we factoring into it some allowance for the energy used in creating and maintaining the transport infrastructures? And in the case of shared use of vehicles by passengers and freight, you know, what assumptions have been made on how we split the CO2 between the people and, and the freight. 
And the other big problem I think that we have is that we lack accurate modal cross elasticity values at present. There's a need for more empirical work to allow us to calibrate some of our modal split models. And then I think this is my penultimate slide. Um, we also encounter uh, environmental trade-offs in the logistics area when we're trying to move to a low-carbon economy. Um, one very topical issue in Europe at the moment is it relates to whether we should allow longer and heavier vehicles um, into more countries. They currently operate only in Finland, Sweden, Sweden and, and the Netherlands. We've just completed a large study in the UK on this very subject. Um, there's no denying that if you consolidate freight in longer and heavier vehicles, you reduce the CO2 footprint for the road freight operation. But if in the process you then divert freight from other lower carbon transport modes, um, then that will offset some of those benefits. And there's also a, an argument that the environmental bodies have, or, have uh, presented that in making freight transport cheaper, you will generate more freight transport. There will be second order effects. Um, so it's very difficult um, balancing these various factors to come up with an estimate of what the net change in CO2 will actually be. And the other trade-off which, again, we encounter is that between cutting CO2 emissions and cutting other externalities in the freight sector. Um, and unfortunately, over the past uh, 20 years or so, um, there's been a fuel efficiency penalty in trying to cut NOx emissions and particulates as we've tightened the Euro emission standards. Um, it's made it harder and harder to improve fuel efficiency and in fact it's argued that when we go to Euro 6 emission standards in 2013 there'll be a, a 2 to 3 percent CO2 penalty in that and I simply ask has the time come for us maybe to reorder our environmental priorities and maybe accept a bit more exhaust pollution um, in an effort to, to cut CO2. Um, I, yeah, I said that was my penultimate site, it's not quite, it's this one. <laughs> Many companies these days are very busily carbon auditing their operations and their supply chains. And one thing that's revealing is that freight transport is often responsible for only a very small percentage of the total carbon footprint. The example I give there is of the CO2 produced in, in making a newspaper. Um, 174 grams of CO2 in the production and distribution operation. The actual newspaper itself only weighs 182 grams. But notice the very small strips in that histogram for transport. The transport's a very small part of the total. Cadbury Schweppes recently worked out its global carbon footprint, found its logistics represented only 4% of the total carbon emissions. It can be therefore hard to motivate companies to focus on decarbonizing their transport when it represents such a small part of the total. They can feel they'll get greater leverage in cutting their carbon footprint by focusing attention on production rather than transport. And I think the uh, advertising slogan that Tesco uses in the UK might be appropriate here. We can see every little counts um, in trying to cut um, carbon emissions from freight. My general conclusions, first of all, there's a broad range of decarbonisation measures available here. Um, Al Gore, I think, once said we're not looking for a, a single silver bullet. It's silver buckshot we need, and I think that certainly would apply um, in this sector. Um, there is a very close correlation between cutting carbon and cutting CO2 merely implementing business best practice, it seems to me, will, will help to, to cut CO2 emissions. Um, I think we have to do our analysis on a life cycle basis so that we see the freight CO2 contributions in context. Um, I think there's a, a serious deficiency in the data we have available on the cost effectiveness of carbon abatement measures in freight. Um, I think, too, that we could improve the data we have on the elasticity values for, um, for freight. It seems to me that economic incentives in this area are going to have uh, most effect on things like modal, modal shift, vehicle utilization, and fuel efficiency. I don't think that the economic incentive measures we're currently examining will have much influence on the structure of supply chains or of logistic systems, nor are they going to uh, reverse deeply entrenched business processes like globalization. Um, I think we'll be deceiving ourselves if we think we can um, fundamentally restructure the global economy by altering the, the freight transport variable. Um, and it, that relates to my final point. I think there's a, an important need, therefore, to coordinate these freight transport carbon abatement measures with wider decarbonisation initiatives across the economy as a whole. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alan, for this very comprehensive introduction. Well, Alan 
has prepared a full paper, which is also in your documents, so uh, you can read the full, te full text, which could not be presented here in detail. I think um, the most important messages are um, there is already an interest in the industry in carbon-saving technology because some of the measures okay, help to save cost for the industry. There are others which might increase cost, which are not so welcome presently, but might be welcome in the future if oil prices are going up a little bit more. Um, and this brings me uh, to the point of technology you have addressed, the technological potential of aerodynamics, propulsion technology, tires, and, and so on. And this relates to the second uh, presentation of Hasse Johansson. Yeah, we need this. Okay, uh, who will concentrate on these technological possibilities, and we will come back to all the other options which you have mentioned, Alan. So the floor is yours, Alan. Uh, Hasse. Okay. Let's see. There we have the starting picture. Good afternoon, my name is Hasse Johansson and I'm responsible for research and development at Scania in Sweden. I will tell you about how Scania interprets the issue of climate change and um, the response we expect from the authorities and how we intend to meet these challenges. Diesel engine development has made significant progress during the last decades when it comes to fuel consumption. Since a big step in the 50s, when we go from pre-combustion to direct injection, a continuous flow of technology steps has been taken towards more fuel efficient engines. The specific fuel consumption, as you can see here in gram per kilowatt hours, is related to pure engine and combustion development. And on the road, we have managed to continuously improve combustion even more and lower the fuel consumption. Here you see the typical uh, fuel consumption for a 40-ton European truck over the years. Every emission step costs fuels. We have heard that earlier today as well. But despite tougher emission level, we have managed to consistently reduce the fuel needed. And for sure, this will continue. We have a lot of state-of-the-art engineering in the pipeline. And the higher the fuel price, the more advanced technology pays off. If we don't act, the CO2 emission from road transport will continue to rise. The biggest part comes from passenger transport with cars as the most significant emitter. While city buses, as you can see in this picture, are hardly visible. So just imagine the effect of even a moderate shift from cars to buses. But it's also obvious that the overall increase comes mainly from goods transport, while other modes are more or less constant over this period. This means that for goods transport, it's not just a matter of a gradual reduction. We need to redirect this trend. And since transport is necessary, we must make better use of the transport system. This is a major challenge for our industry and a very exciting one from a technical point of view. The burden on different modes may of course vary between member states. And remember the 10% figure as an average in the US in this sector that are not subject for emission trading. And in some countries, as you can see here, the greenhouse gas emissions are required to drop up to 20%. In Skonia's opinion, this is tough, but it's still achievable. Let's look how we will meet this. The politicians can and will introduce various measures to promote this development. Fuel tax, investment support, traffic restrictions, and various toll systems are likely. But to be effective, fuel taxes, for example, will have to be raised a lot. 
The same applies for the other measures. This is actually a fine balance to strike. Either they still miss the target or become a threat to the welfare. But higher cost will mean that cost saving is even more interesting than today. Driver training always pays back. The driver support system helps driver take the most out of every drop of the fuel. Greater respect for speed limits and making sure tire pressure are always right also saves a great deal. IT system to support logistics will contribute and so will continuous engineering refinement and the use of hybrids. More attractive public transport system will attract car drivers and thus reduce the biggest part of the transport emission. Coordinated and multimodal transport planning holds a great promise as well. Each mode of transport has its advantages and with coordinated planning system, transportation can become much more efficient. Today, Scania can offer its customers a choice of running on conventional diesel, ethanol, synthetic diesel, biodiesel and biogas and I think this is a very good start. Ethanol is in many ways the best renewable fuel that is available right now. If produced in the right way, ethanol gives a substantial CO2 reduction. Synthetic diesel from biomass is produced in a process launched by Neste in Finland. We heard that this morning at the other session. Biodiesel is produced from, for instance, rapeseed, but the amount available are insufficient and there is some competition with food production, as recently has been discussed. Biogas is good from a mission point of view, but the gas tanks are bulky and heavy on board a vehicle. These fuels give valuable CO2 reductions already now, and the operating cost is reasonable. In a few years, hybrid will start to make sense, combined with biofuels, of course, and some application also with plug-in hybrids. Ethanol from cellulose will complement the ethanol we have today because uh, being just as efficient as the ethanol from sugarcane of today. Second generation biomass to liquid and dimethyl ether will come in a couple of years later based on more efficient process than just on the development. Bio-based hydrogen and fuel cell will not be a realistic alternative until well beyond 2020, unfortunately. And uh, we also heard um, this morning John Haywood had the same opinion, but he said that it was all the way up to 2035 before uh, this will take off. But once hydrogen can be produced from renewable material, and once fuel cells technology is mature enough, these are looking brighter for these technologies and the combination of, of these two technologies. But right now we have the opinion and option to the left and um, of those we consider ethanol to be by far the best solution and we absolutely need to start now. So the challenges on the road towards sustainable transport system are to use renewable fuels that are available and sustainable, to make maximum use of technology to create viable fuel saving solutions, including hybrids and driver support systems, and to make the transport system as efficient as possible using multimodal solution and advanced logistics. At Scania, we look forward to being part of the solution. Thank you. Well, we have learned that there is already potential for reducing CO2 production with using present technologies, which is already on the market, which can already be bought from the market. What might lack is the incentives, okay, for buying this technology. And you have mentioned that in Euro 6, there's a discussion of introducing uh, CO2 production also in the new standards. Until now, okay, we only know that the reduction of NOx and, and particulate matter, okay, is a big issue of Euro 6, but I think 
um, this round might come to the conclusion that it is urgently necessary okay, also to introduce carbon dioxide into the new classification of the Euro 6 standard. And we know that these standards are very effective. So as soon as you use these standards for differentiating infrastructure charges, for instance, then the industry will be interested in buying this new technology. So that's uh, the comment for a while. Uh, I would like to invite the discussants now to take the floor for some comments. And after that, I would invite the floor to comment and to give their experience and tell something about best practices which they have experienced in their countries. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah. You go first. Very good things I heard. Um, uh, first of all, I'm Willem Heeren from uh, Jan Rijk Logistics and Chairman of the Dutch Transport Association. Um, what I miss is, is CO2, of course, is a general topic, uh, a macro discussion. But if you want to stimulate the industry to reduce it, they're all individual players. So I think we better start with, um, with good measurement techniques that every, every company uh, starts to know what is his CO2 emission today uh, because that stimulates that company also uh, to see what measures he has taken, what effect it has, whether it's better technology, uh, whether it's better fuels, whether it's uh, best practices, whether it's uh, optimization of its logistics network. And that's what we're doing in the Netherlands as an initiative is um, first a, a neutral general reporting system for individual companies to see where are we today and what effect has every step that you are mentioning in your presentations for the years to come. Because then I think it will start to live with those companies to see can we reduce it individually 10, 15 or 20 percent. That's my principal comment on this one. So I would like to, to make some comment on, on Ellen's uh, presentation. So first of all, my name is Martin Wegner and I'm from DHL in charge for all the innovation projects within technology and innovation management of Deutsche Post. So you stated that you expect or feel that a 27% reduction target is achievable. Um, however, with governmental measures and, and, and support, and um, within Deutsche Post, we feel that even a 30% reduction target is achievable without any uh, yeah, governmental support. We believe that uh, we, on a voluntary basis, can achieve this target until the year 2020, and that has been communicated just a couple of weeks ago. And um, you've also stated that you feel that there's a correlation between CO2 reduction and cost reduction. On the mid-term or long-term basis, I believe that might become true. However, uh, we within DHL invest heavily in coming up with such kind of CO2 reduction measures. We have bundled all the activities in a dedicated uh, so-called innovation center, uh, which requires quite some investment to come to come up with uh, CO2 reduction uh, solutions. Uh, however, I agree with you on the long term that pays off uh, for the company and uh, for the industry. And um, maybe um, one last point, you mentioned network planning um, is definitely uh, a contributor to uh, CO2 reduction. However, you aren't so sure whether um, decentralizing is much better than centralizing. Uh, we um, push uh, and we believe uh, that all our strategic network planning tools needs to incorporate uh, green factor, so is the CO2 emission as a standard factor. So today we are using cost and time basically as the core parameters and in the future, and we have started that already, CO2 will be um, an integral part of such kind of, of um, network planning tools, uh, which then eventually come, f come to the uh, most appropriate answer. Well, I think this is a very important aspect that CO2 reduction is becoming a major indicator within the companies, which is also set as a goal, okay, and where the companies treat this uh, goal uh, just like the reduction of cost or the increase of revenues. And in many cases, there is a correlation between cost 
reduction and CO2 reduction. And this would be the start motivation uh, to go this way. Um, now we have, say, concentrated a little bit on, on road uh, transport, Hasse, and therefore I would like to give Jan Olof Lunder the opportunity to intervene because he is representing Bombardier and the railway industry. Thank you. Yes, the question is how can uh, rail contribute to a better environment? And uh, we think at Bombardier that uh, the climate now is right for trains. So, the ecological benefits of uh, rail transport are considerable, and um, since energy is transferred most efficiently between the steel wheel and uh, the steel track, energy use of rail vehicles, and therefore, of course, the related emissions, are much lower than other forms of motorized land transportation. And in addition, of course, the land use is significantly lower than compared to road transportation. Um, the rail vehicles are also developing in several aspects and um, in general we are moving to a lower energy use in our vehicles. Uh, as an example, we now implement drive style management systems for an improved energy efficiency when driving the trains, uh, improved electrical motors with new technologies, uh, reduced weight of course of the vehicles and improved uh, aerodynamics and uh, recuperation of the brake energy. Uh, and also, of course, uh, multi-system vehicles that uh, promotes an increased transport efficient efficiency between countries. Um, so, uh, remember that electrical trains are already plugged-in vehicles, so to speak. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think this is important that there is no stagnation of technology with the railways. Okay. The road industry is pushing, I think, a little bit more compared with the rail industry, but I think there's a very healthy competition between these modes, and I think also uh, the potential in the railway industry is considerable, particularly with respect to diesel traction and new generations of electrical traction. Um, therefore, I'm very grateful for this comment. and. This brings me to open the discussion to the floor. Anybody like to intervene? Yes, please take the microphone and introduce yourself. Hello, uh, my name is Shalor Leclerc from Uppsala University. Uh, in announcement of this forum, it was said that peak oil should be discussed also, but I have not heard so much about that yet. And I uh, ask the industry here, the fact is that the uh, International Energy Agency just cut 16 million barrels per day in the forecast production and they have now gone down to, in total to 20 million barrels uh, per day. And uh, in November I expect to see another cut uh, of 15-20 uh, million barrels per day uh, and uh, to come down to reality. Uh, how much uh, is uh, this affecting the industry when it comes uh, to producing new models to, uh, to be more efficient? The fact that uh, there will not be as much oil in 2030 in production as it is today. Who would like to respond? Hasse? As I said, the best driver for technology development is the oil prices. So I expect when they cut the production, the prices will continue to go up. That means that we have an opportunity to use more advanced technology that really will pay off in the commercial vehicle industry that we can't just charge more for the vehicle. Uh, our customer expect payback within six months or two, probably 12, 15 months at the most. So therefore, every single increase of the fuel prices would um, give an opportunity for us to take once another small step in our technology development. And I think that's a benefit for the whole society. Are there further interventions? Please, go ahead. Um, my name is Wieren Fritz-Pitt from the Dutch National Motorway and Waterway Operator. Um, I have one small technical remark and a bit more strategic remark. The technical remark is that two of the speakers noticed that the Euro um, standards for uh, vehicle emissions have pushed up the CO2 emissions a little bit. That's true, but on the other hand, it uh, it's get, gets clearer and clearer that um, 
uh, diesel suit, so particulate matter, is a greenhouse substance in itself. So maybe the CO2 uh, increase is being offset by, uh, by the greenhouse effects of the uh, particulate decrease. Um, so that might, the situation might not be as bad as it was sketched. And then on a more strategic level, uh, I'd like to pay attention to uh, inland waterways and sea shipping. Um, I think um, in the waterway sector, uh, the technology pushes that have been active in rail and road uh, have not done as much to decrease the emissions, so there's a lot to be gained. And even now, uh, inland waterways are much more effective, much more energy effective than uh, than many other um, transport modes, as uh, Mr. McKinnon sketched. So I think there is a big opportunity. Although in the Netherlands we have the dilemma that one, that, that the transport sector that will um, sense the adverse effects of climate change first are the inland waterways. So we uh, we will experience in inland waterways the adverse effects uh, already in a very short time. Uh, due, to the, um, uh, due to the bigger uh, differences in water levels in the rivers, especially in the Rhine. So there's a, that's a big dilemma for us, maybe also for other low-lying low countries. But I'd like to, um, to endorse uh, inland shipping. Okay, I'm very grateful for this intervention. Um, it is clear that, say, through uh, diverting traffic to inland waterways or to coastal shipping, CO2 emissions could be saved. But on the other hand, these modes uh, are using very dirty fuel presently. So a consequence of this message is also that these sectors have to change the fuel quality dramatically in the future. So yeah. next intervention, yes. please. I think it's me. I will make my comment in French. Euh, donc, Charles Leroux du laboratoire d'économie des transports à Lyon. Euh, on a vu dans les précédents exposés une vue. We have heard from the previous speakers. Faut-il le rappeler, c'est réduire donc le carbone brûlé dans le carburant, c'est donc réduire la consommation de carburant fossile. Et je pose une première question, est-ce que c'est le rôle de la puissance publique de fixer des, des objectifs intermédiaires, tels que le remplissage des véhicules, tels que euh, les parts modales Alors, Alan McKinnon nous a montré que ces objectifs intermédiaires pouvaient amener des résultats inattendus, pas toujours positifs en matière d'émissions de CO2. Alors je pense que l'information... We have not always achieved the positive results we wanted to achieve, and I think that the possibility of innovations, especially, uh, rests with the uh, business actors rather than with the public fist. Now, what is uh, our aim? We should have the players negotiate. They're in a better position than we are to do something to reduce uh, carbon emissions. It's about the people responsible for the logistics change, about the manufacturers, the automotive industry. And of course, um, you can always in, um, provide certain constraints. This can, done via, can be done via price, but it's visible that the politicians are uh, often against further taxes being levied. And then there's always the problem of the tax possibilities and the harmonization of tax at EU level. This is always a problem. There is Another alternative, a certain rationing of the quantity. And the problem of the tax harmonization really has to be subjected to a close analysis. We should get to integration of transport within the European system. We should look at the US. There are some similar projects. And one should should look at what uh, ways of integration of transport there are. One, 
Member of the Good afternoon. Like to yes. respond, or do uh, we have a, a further intervention? If you need to respond first, it's too much. yeah, I, I have the microphone. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marco Sorgetti. I'm the director of CLECAT. We are the European level representation of freight forwarding and logistic enterprises. Um, I wanted to make two or three observations and share them with you. Um, on the issue of biofuels, there is one factor, an element that very often is forgotten. Um, plants are a machine that consumes CO2. So when you grow plants with the photosynthesis, you obtain a, a, a CO2 reduction by growing the plants. Um, when it comes to the idea of competition between modes, we tend to have a different view. Uh, modes have to cooperate, actually, in our view, to obtain a better result because uh, they, they are, in a way, specialized to the type of cargo that you carry. You cannot shift modes at random. You have to use the adapted mode for each kind of cargo. And uh, you can, of course, um, change the modal choice a little bit uh, by making some of them more efficient. I mean, I don't deny that uh, the rail has been growing in efficiency, and uh, we think that it will certainly be more and more appealing in the future. The more it grows in efficiency, the better it will be used. Um, the third remark that I'd like to make is that this um, originally a problem of CO2 emission must be looked at today as a colossal, enormous business opportunity for Europe. We, we have to make it a business opportunity. It is a colossal business, and as a business, it has to be treated. Um, these remarks have already been made public by Clickert, but I'd like to share them with you today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So we have time for... Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Kevin McKinley from the International Organization for Standardization, ISO, ISO. Uh, and I'm finding this discussion very interesting, and there certainly has been quite an